Excellent. You guys can have a seat. Probably at home, you're standing in your living room or on your couch or something. You can sit down now. That's good. All right, so Christmas is over. Yes, it's all done. Was it a lovely time? Did you have fun at Christmas and New Year's and all that? Okay, all of that fun is over now. It's done. We're finished with it. So we are, we're going to, you know, it's New Year's and it's time to look squarely at the bad news. It's time to face reality, my friends. It's time to face reality. You guys ready for some bad news? What's church without a little bad news to start us off? Okay, so here's some bad news. We're, we're starting a series, this isn't bad news, we're starting a series called Church Works. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But check this out. Here we go. We'll start right in to the bad news. There is a pandemic going on. And it's not just, I'm not talking about COVID. I'm talking about a pandemic of anxiety, fear, and depression that has been increasing in the world for a long time. Check this out. This is uh, Tyler Vanderweel uh, from Harvard. And he is a professor, I guess, of human flourishing is what his title is. I'm gonna have a number of quotes from him today. Here we go. Here's one. Deaths of despair, by which he means people who died because they were really, really desperate. They were stuck in depression or in anxiety, and that was the direct cause or the proximate cause of their death, whether they died by suicide or drugs or alcohol. Those are the, the three main actual causes of death for these deaths of despair. Deaths of despair have led to reduced life expectancies in the United States for three consecutive years in 2015, 2016, and 2017, the longest consecutive decline in life expectancy since World War I. Think about that for a moment. We're talking about since World War I in the United States, and most of these stats are U.S., but you can bet that Canada is following right along that same curve, right? Since World War I, life expectancies have risen almost only up and only had a couple little blips down, and the longest decline was driven by deaths of despair. Not cancer, not obesity, not heart disease. The longest decline was driven by deaths of despair. Here's something else he said. Oh, this is awful news. In the United States, emergency room visits related to depression, anxiety, and similar conditions increased 28% between 2011 and 2015. Think about what kind of a jump that is. 28%, that's almost a third of an increase. And then, of course, after that, we all had to mask up because of this other pandemic that's going on. What do you think that did to the pandemic of anxiety and depression and deaths of despair? Now, the full information will not be in for a number of years, but we have some already. Three weeks ago, at the beginning, beginning of December, the attorney, uh, not the attorney general, the Surgeon General of the United States reported this. Globally, symptoms of anxiety and depression doubled during the pandemic. So from 2011 to 2015, it got way worse, anxiety and depression all over the world, 28% worse, it increased by almost a third. And then during the pandemic, it doubled. So when you look around and you feel like you have this sense that maybe the world is kind of darker than it was, it feels like there's more anxiety in people around you, that is absolutely the case. People are trapped in it. And of course, we've just been ramped up again, right, with our news media to another level of anxiety. This is really bad news. Should we stop there? Go away? cry ourselves to sleep. Okay, here's some of the good news. Some of it. We still have the church. Here we are, right here in church, either online or physically present. If you're physically present in church today, give me a shout out. Let me, let me hear you. You're here. 
You're alive. You're together at church. We're going to look at the word of God. We've been singing songs of worship together. And that has a powerful, powerful effect on you and on the whole world. It's actually an essential, maybe even the central aspect of God's plan for this time period in history. How he's going to redeem the world is through the church. I don't just mean community of Hope Church or some particular church. His people, the body of Christ, of which we are one part. A couple more pictures. Worship. Did you worship today? Have you worshiped yet? I hope that you have. Whether you raised your hands or not, I hope that you engaged in worship. Now, I'm going to share a few more statistics, studies, about what effect church has on people. This all comes from, and I will link this in the online version, and we'll send it out in the church email. This comes from an article uh, by the Gospel Coalition a couple of months ago that compiled a whole bunch of different studies and quotes from people who research, okay, what effect does going to church actually have on someone? Do they become, you know, more judgmental and, you know, worse people after going to church? Or are they better off after they go to church? And, well, we're going to find out. You probably already know the answer. Check this out. This is the same guy, uh, this Harvard professor of uh, human flourishing. And here's a quote, sort of a general quote, that kind of gets at the main thrust here. If one could conceive of a single elixir to improve the physical and mental health of millions of Americans or any people, not just Americans, at no personal cost, not quite true, no financial cost, what value would society place on it? He identifies that magic elixir as weekly church attendance. Check this out. Attending church once a week or more is correlated with, I think we got a word in there I shouldn't have, is correlated with reduced mortality by 20 to 30 percent over a 15-year period. Now, sometimes we read a statistic and it just washes over our mind. Just stop and think about that for a minute. What is that saying? It is saying that when we study people who go to church regularly, now notice this was not once a month. This is people who went at least once a week. That's pretty often. That means they were going to church on Sunday morning and many of them were going to something else as well. They were probably involved. What kind of things might they have been involved in? Classes, community group, Youth group, serving in other ways, young adults group, something else that they added on to that as well. So this is a pretty major time commitment in some ways. But for these people, on average, mortality, the likelihood that they will die over a 15-year period, was reduced by 20 to 30% in a whole slew of studies. 20 to 30 percent. Is there even anything else that does that? I don't know. Maybe like eating versus not eating. That is massive. That is such a massive shift. And notice as we're talking about these things, reducing uh, reducing the chance that you're going to die isn't even the main point of church. This is a side benefit from going to church. This isn't even, this, did any of you come to church today because you were worried that you were going to die over the next 15 years and you thought if you came to church this morning, you would probably live longer? Probably not. Maybe somebody goes for that reason. Probably only a professor who knows all the stats. I don't know. But this isn't even the main point of church. Let's look at some other things here. These are all quotes from the same source. Uh, Those who participate in religious services at least once a week are more optimistic, have lower rates of depression, and are less likely to commit suicide than those who don't. Not only that, the, the, the difference is not small. 
It's not some barely, uh, barely significant difference. Check this out on, on suicide rates. One large-scale study of U.S. women found that those who attended religious services at least once a week were five times less likely to kill themselves than those who never attended. Five times. And finally, you might think, or someone might be tempted to think, is it just because you're around other people? I mean, we know that if you are around other people, you have good social relationships, contacts, that you will be healthier. That's something that's been known for a long time. So is, is the effect of church attendance, is it just because you're around other people? Is it the same effect as if you were part of a club that met once a week or, or some other organization? And the answer is no, it's not the same. Social support seems to account for only about one quarter of the benefits of religious participation. So most of that difference comes from something else that researchers are still only just guessing at. What is even this other thing? We'll talk about that as we go through this service. But the point here is not that you should come to church so you can live longer, okay? Or even that you, maybe a little bit you should come to church so that you shouldn't be depressed or have anxiety because perfect love drives out fear. We come to church, we meet with God, both directly by his spirit and in the presence of his people in whom his spirit lives. And God is perfect love and he drives out fear, depression, darkness. Does this mean that people who go to church are never depressed? No, don't take it that way either. I don't want anybody to walk away thinking, well, I go to church and I still struggle with these things, so something must be wrong with me. No, that's not the case. Some, life is very difficult, and we have to work out our salvation with fear and trembling together, don't we? So Christians still sometimes commit suicide, sometimes are depressed, full of anxiety, and we got to struggle through that and help others, help carry, help bear their burdens with them. That's part of why we're here. But there is this massive effect. And what I want to point out just as we start this series, today is kind of an introductory message to this series that we're going to do called Church Works. And what I want to point out is that church works. It actually works. And this isn't even its main goal. So the main goal of church is to unite you with God, to make you more like Christ, and to, to somehow achieve a salvation, resurrection from the dead one day, and eternal life with God. Everything that we were made for, and church is one of God's, church is maybe God's central tool right now at this time in history to achieve that. Not on its own, but because God is here with us, and it's his plan, it's the way he's chosen to do it. But I do want to point out, you know, as we go through this, we'll look at this again and again. You know, if you are joining with us online, we are so glad that you're here. We are very, very excited that you're joining with us online. And we can't see you. We can't see you. And we have no idea if you're reaping any of these benefits. There's not enough research on that to show. But almost for sure, it's not as strong of an effect. All of these benefits come from in-person church attendance, weekly or more. And that's something that it seems like the whole world is designed to try and stop right now. So as we move forward through this other pandemic that we're not really going to talk about all that much anymore because everybody's sick of talking about it, right? Yeah. As we continue to move through it and whatever comes, we got to recognize not uh, church, is, church is vitally important because of our relationship with God, but it also has massive health benefits. We got to weigh all this stuff in the scale. All right. What we're going to do today, this series that we're launching into, and I probably last about eight or ten weeks, so a couple of months plus, is called Church Works. And a while ago, I was, I was talking with a friend who was impressing on me. He, he, he was grieving. He was, he was saying, I wish the average person who goes to church, the average believer, had a sense of what they're supposed to do 
to help fulfill the mission of God. God's given us this mission, right? Uh, We read it in Matthew 28 earlier. We'll read it again in a minute. Go into all the world and make disciples of every nation. Are you intimidated by that mission? If you look at that mission and think, okay, God is asking me by myself to go into all the world and make disciples of every nation, let's just say that's not realistic. Now, God can do anything, right? But he's not, he's not giving this mission to an individual. And he's not asking each person to fulfill every role. That's the thing. So it's kind of like this. Imagine if you were, you were at the beginning of one of the great world wars, you know, World War I or World War II, and someone came to you and said, you need to go and win this war. That would be an overwhelming task. You wouldn't even know where to begin, right? It's impossible. But the truth is that if you had lived through one of those wars, your job would have been to do whatever your job was, right? Whether that was military service or on the home front, your job would have been to serve and do, you know, help fulfill the mission as part of a huge body of people all working toward the same goal. And the same is true here. All right, so we're going to look at a few verses. We're going to look at... uh, It's kind of two meanings of this title that I've given you, Church Works. The first meaning is that it works. It's God's plan, and if we follow His plan, it will work. In fact, even if we don't follow His plan, He is great enough that ultimately His plan will work. It just won't work through me if I don't follow His plan. It will work in some other way. But I want to see God's plan work through me in my lifetime. How about you? I want to see his plan work through me and in me so that my life can have meaning and have eternal value. So church works. It's God's plan to save the world. Now, didn't he save the world by sending his son, Jesus? Yes, Jesus died for us on the cross and then he created the church and he sent us out on this mission to bring the knowledge of the gospel, the good news to the whole world. And that mission, this church, can never fail. It's working right now. So we're going to look at a few verses here just to kind of get an overview of, okay, is this really God's plan to save the world? It seems like kind of a sketchy plan, right? He's going to base, he's going to make his plan dependent on human beings, us, right here in this room. Yes, this is really his plan. He's going to make it partly dependent on us. That's crazy. Let's take a look at a few verses here. So Matthew 22 This is what's known as the great commandment. So this is where Jesus sums up the Old Testament. He said, if you're going to sum it up, if you were going to say, what's the most important command out of all those laws that were given uh, through Moses and in the Old Testament, what is it? So it begins like this. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, these are some people who've been asking questions, the Pharisees got together. They thought they were still really smart. They could silence him better than the Sadducees, maybe. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, rabbi, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. So this is powerful, right? And we talked about we have a church purpose statement that we talk about pretty often here. Let's see, let me go to it here. Here we go. This is our church purpose statement. Let's say it together. You're going to notice it's very similar to that greatest commandment, which actually has two parts. Let's say, what, what is our purpose here at Community of Hope Church? What are we trying to do? Our purpose is helping people grow in their relationship with God and with each other. So when Jesus gave this greatest commandment, he's saying this is God's vision for what human beings are going to become like. This is what we were made to be. We were made to be people who the most important, most fundamental truth about us isn't what we've achieved or how impressive we are or how much we have. The most important fundamental truth about us This is what we were made to be, is that we would be people 
who with everything we are, love and serve God. And just like that, we would be people who with everything we are, genuinely love and serve those who are around us, our neighbor, the people who are near to us. There's a ton of those people. Don't try and get out of who is my neighbor. That's a bad idea. Jesus will shut you down. Check out Luke 10. Okay, so that's the first thing. So this is the vision that he gave, right? So Jesus and the Old Testament, the whole Bible, here's the vision of what humanity was going to be like. So Jesus arrives on the scene. The whole world is a mess full of darkness, anxiety, depression, fear. So what does Jesus start doing? Right? He, doesn't, he doesn't make a political movement. He doesn't start a new government. They kept wanting him to do that. He says, no, no, no. What he does is he grabs a few people and he starts making them more like this. That's his plan. And then he dies on the cross and rises from the dead, defeating death and making a way for people to have a life that is with God. And as you live a life with God, you can grow significantly in this. We won't become perfect in this during our lives here on earth, but we can become vastly, vastly different than we were before. We can become people in whom the Spirit of God is powerfully active. Jesus described it like, like this. You can become, in John 4, he says, you can become like, like God's power in you. His grace, his life is like water in you, making it so you're not thirsty on the inside anymore, and then even bubbling up and overflowing until you become like a stream overflowing into the thirsty world around you. Jesus is saying, realistically, with his power, we can become like that especially as we follow him together. So he grabbed a bunch of these people and he started doing this. These people were initially called his disciples, right? People who were his students, people who would learn from him, who would follow him, who would serve him. And that's what we are if you have given your life to Christ. We are his disciples today. And then he gave his disciples this mission, right? So he died, rose from the dead. His disciples were still trembling in fear and anxiety and not sure what to do. We'll start right here, Matthew 28. I didn't put verse 17 up there, but I probably should always include verse 17 because this is where we stand when we come to what's called the Great Commission, the mission that we are supposed to be on, that we are on, given by God, a mission together. And it begins that the resurrected Jesus is right in front of the disciples. Imagine what that would have been like. You could see a man right in front of you who came back to life from the dead, who defeated death, who's got holes in his hands and a hole in his side, but he's not bleeding anymore, and he's overflowing with life. He's probably shining like the sun, at least in some moments he was. He's got a life beyond anything you had ever imagined and he's standing right in front of you and you are still scared out of your mind. It says they, they're looking at him and yet still some doubted. And that's exactly what we're like as we approach this, but that's okay because God is with us to help us. So Jesus came to them because they still doubted even after he's standing right in front of them and he's about to disappear. They're not going to be able to physically see him anymore. He's still right here today. Can you feel him? But he was about to disappear. He's not going to be with them anymore. And he says this, don't worry. All authority, all power, everything in heaven and on earth has been given to me. It doesn't belong to darkness anymore. It belongs to me. So don't worry about what's going to happen in your life. I'm in control. So what you need to do is just do what I'm asking you to do. Okay, it all belongs to me. So you need to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. If you're here in person, sorry for those of you who are online, you won't see this. If you're here in person, we're going to see a baptism in just a little while. Praise God baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. So making more and more disciples. It's a perpetual world revolution. Starting from the bottom up, starting from the inside out, it begins with individual human hearts and it reaches the entire world. And surely I am with you always 
This is a promise for those who are on his mission. We don't have to be doing it perfectly. We will never be doing it perfectly. But if we are trying to follow him, if we're trying to be on his mission, then he promises that he will be with us. And that's life right there. That's what it is. It's not all those other things that all the world and culture and media try to convince us that it is. This is life. This is Jesus' picture of the rest of your life. Helping people grow in their relationship with God and with each other. All right, let me read you just a couple more verses here. Uh, we'll be in Ephesians a number of times during this, uh, this study. We'll be in Matthew quite a bit during this series. We'll be in Ephesians. We'll be in Romans some. That will be very exciting. We haven't looked at Romans very much in, at Community of Hope for quite a long time. Uh, so here's a verse, some verses from Ephesians chapter 2, which is an amazing summary of the gospel, of what God has done, the good news. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians 2. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. So the first part here is just like we said, Jesus came into the world. He started grabbing people and bringing them back toward what they were made to be, making them alive. In God, in God uh, and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. So he's going to display his goodness. He's going to reveal to the whole world, and even more than just the whole world, all humans, he's going to reveal who he is through us. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. It's nothing we accomplish on our own. We could never have accomplished any of it. For we are God's handiwork, his workmanship. We are the thing he's making, he has made and is making, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So this is just another place where we see God's plan to save the world. His plan was, I'll send my son Jesus to die and then to rise from the dead. I'll open a doorway to life with me. And then Jesus is going to start grabbing people and bringing them in through that doorway. And then those people are going to be changed and they're going to go start grabbing other people. I'm going to create this body of people this household, family of God. There are several different key metaphors in the Bible to describe the church. Again, we don't just mean some particular church or a building or even just something that we do. We mean the people of God, united by His Spirit. His intent, a little bit later in Ephesians in chapter 3, God's intent was that now through the church the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. He's even going to display through his church to angels and demons his power and his goodness. According to the, his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here in Romans 12, this is the last verse we'll look at for today. One more thing that we need to point out about the church and how it works. We're going to be talking about the fact that church works. It's God's plan and it works. We're also going to be talking about in this series how it works. And our hope, our prayer is that you will walk away from this series with a clear picture of what am I supposed to do to fit in? You don't have to do everything. You have to do the part that you are called to do. And here we see Paul talking about exactly that reality. By the grace given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourselves more highly than you ought. But rather, so don't think that you can do everything <laughs> or that it all depends on you. Rather, think of yourselves 
with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members or parts. So here he's talking about you have a physical body. You got hands and eyes and ears and a heart. One body with many members. And these members do not all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. We'll stop there. I won't read the rest of this verse. We'll read it another time. We have different gifts. There are different ways that we are supposed to serve. There's some things we're all supposed to be doing. But many of those things, it's different pieces of each of those that we're supposed to be doing. So we'll be looking at through this series, how God's plan, what God's plan is, and then how it works in practical everyday terms. And so we're going to look at that in a number of different categories. Church works, the second, the second uh, note for your notes today, if you want to write this down, church works, our part. What is he asking me to do? And we're going to talk about that in six different categories. Here, I'll just tell you what they are, and then we'll move on in our time of worship today. Number one, God is asking us as part of his body to engage in fellowship, deep relationship with one another, and then to start to extend that even outside the church to draw others in. Number two, he's asking us to engage in worship. And we're going to spend quite a bit of time in this series talking about what in the world is worship. What, is, what are we supposed to be doing in this moment, these moments when we're singing and doing all the other things we do on Sunday mornings, and how does that relate to our life outside of Sunday morning? He's asking us to engage in worship. These are part of how church works. Number three, service. God is asking us to serve in the church, as part of his body, in the organization of the church, and also as part of his body extending help and care to people outside the body of Christ. Giving. We're going to talk about giving a number of times. We've grown in this a ton. It's very important. It's very important in our development. It's very important as part of God's plan. Character. This is huge. We have to be growing on the inside in who we are, becoming more like Jesus is on the inside. If that's not happening, God's plan will in large part fail. We have to be growing and we can be by his power. And finally, evangelism, reaching out to others, spreading the good news. And that's, that's a word that sometimes is intimidating, but it's not when you realize that your part has to do with the things God has gifted you to do. We all have a part to play. So over these next weeks, we'll be looking at God's plan for the world, how his plan works. It does work. And what the different pieces are and how you fit into that. Pray with me and we'll continue in worship.